Greet you this morning with the joy of Jesus. I hope that you have enjoyed our young people. Uh, in as much as it is fourth Sunday, we thought we would pull some clips of them uh, from some previous services where they were lifting up and praising our God. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed them this morning. We also want to remind you that as as much as it's fourth Sunday, this is also our communion Sunday. And so at the end of service today, when I complete this message, we're going to be enjoying the ordinance of communion together in our own homes. And so I'm going to ask that if you've not done so already, that you would get together some bread and some crackers, some juice and some water, and just gather it together so you'll be ready to be able to participate uh, in the ordinance of communion uh, as we remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. Amen? All right, it's preaching time. Listen, today we're going to continue with our sermon series on crisis management. 
And we've lifted up a text today uh, from uh, Psalms, from the Psalms. We're going to be in Psalm 91 this morning. Psalm 91. And we're going to start our reading at verse number one. We're going to do Psalm 91, verses one through six. And then we're going to pick up our reading in verse number 14. This morning I'm reading from the NIV version. From the NIV version, Psalm 91, uh, verse one. This is what it says. It says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Then we go down to verse 14. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. As the Lord shall lead this morning, we want to speak on the topic of peace in a pandemic. Peace in a pandemic. Come on and pray with me. Our Father, our God, we thank you this morning for allowing us to gather together virtually one more time. Thank you for those who are with us. Thank you for those who are worshiping with us. Lord, we thank you today, God, that we've made altars in our own homes. And God, in as much as the altar is the place where humankind meets God, today, God, meet us at our altar. Today, God, speak to us in our place of abode. God, let us hear your voice and let us move in, a, in accordance with your divine will. God, I pray for the anointing for preaching, that your word would go forth and not come back void. We claim the victory and we claim it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Listen, today we're going to continue our series uh, on crisis management. And we're going to go to our second in that series. Uh, you know, last week we asked the question, and the question is, where's God in all this mess? And in that, in that, we were asked, really, what we were asking ourselves was, is uh, we're trying to figure out why is it that God would let us go through something like this? And God answered us, and God let us know that in the midst of the trial, that God is right there. That in the midst of the trial, that God is drawing us closer to God, and that God is setting up the glory. And you know what? I've discovered that there are uh, when you talk about crisis management, that there are three phases to crisis management. The first phase is pre-crisis. This is the planning. This is the anticipation. This is the uh, anticipating the unexpected. But then once a crisis hit, the second phase comes, and this is when we actually have to respond to the crisis. We have to actually do something. And then the final phase of, a cri of crisis management is what you do when it's all over. How do you recover and re-emerge? And where we find ourselves today is we find ourselves in that second phase. We find ourselves uh, having to know how to respond and how to react to what's going on in and around us. And I believe it helps us, obviously, to prepare for a crisis, to prepare for a crisis when you know uh, the why behind it, when you plan and anticipate it, to understand that God will be with us. That's what we talked about last week, that God is with us and that God is being glorified in it. But next, after you plan for it, you need to know what to do when you're in the middle of it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because even though we're in the midst of a crises of a global pandemic right now, we know that's not the only trouble that we're going to face. We're well acquainted with all kinds of crises that visit humankind, from natural disasters, floods, and tornadoes, and hurricanes, to financial crises that come with the loss of a job or that come along with a recession. We know about crises in our society. We know about the crises of injustice. We know about the crises of poverty. We know about the crises of violence. We deal with this. We deal with personal crises, a mental crisis, a, a 
crises of hope, uh, crises of illness, things that come and disrupt our normal activities, things that come and disrupt our normal functioning. And so we need to know what to do when trouble hits, because the Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the, and the Bible says, think it not strange when you go through these various vicissitudes of life. The, but the Bible assures us that we will endure hardship and pain. So because we're going to go through, we need to know how to handle it. I'm reminded this morning of a story about a pastor who was traveling back home on a plane uh, after a very long flight after he had finished, uh, finished up a, uh, a church conference. And the flight was, was going smoothly until all of a sudden that fastened seatbelt light came on on the plane. And then after that light came on, a calm voice came on, and the calm voice came on letting them know that there would be no beverage service today because they were expecting a little turbulence. Everybody was asked to please remain in their seats. And so the pastor looked around and he could see that, you know, in the midst of this, that people were getting a little anxious. Quite a few passengers were, were becoming anxious, and so he offered up a quick prayer. A short while later, that calm voice came back on the intercom again, and this time that voice announced that there would be no meal service because of the turbulence that they were now experiencing. That went on for a while, and then the storm broke. The thunder was so loud that you could hear it above the sound of the jet engines. The lightning lit up the dark sky, and it, and it felt like the plane was now being tossed and driven uh, by in, uh, around the air of the storm. And now the pastor looked around, and everybody on the plane, nearly every passenger on the plane, had the look of alarm on their face. Every passenger, that is, except for one passenger, except for one little girl. And this little girl, she was sitting there in her seat. She didn't appear worried. She didn't appear anxious. In fact, she sat calmly there with her feet tucked underneath her while she was looking at pictures in a book. She would close her eyes as if she was nodding for a while, and then she would go back and look at her book some more. She seemed to be oblivious to the turbulence. She seemed to be oblivious to the panic that was all around us. And so in time, the, the storm passed over, and the plane landed, and the pastor saw the young little girl. He saw her in the airport, and he went up to her and approached her. And he asked the little girl, why is it that, that, that you were not scared on the plane? Why is it that when everybody else, when all the other passengers were afraid, when all the other passengers, uh, when everybody else was so anxious, why is it that you were calm in the midst of the storm? And the little girl looked at him. She didn't hesitate to answer him. She just simply said, I, was, I wasn't upset. I wasn't angry. I wasn't anxious because my daddy is the pilot. And I knew that he would get me home safely. So she was able to sit there in peace because she trusted that her father would get her home safely. She sat there calmly and she sat there in peace because she knew that her father was in charge, was in control of that airplane. She had peace in the midst of a crisis and so must we. Because our God does not promise us a life without crises. Our God does not promise us a life without trouble. Our God does not promise us a life without danger. But God does assure us that we will not be alone in the struggle. And I want you to know that that's the kind of assurance, an assurance that we have when we look at Psalm 91. Psalm 91 has, has become almost the uh, foundational passage of scripture that people turn to in this pandemic. And, and I understand it because it's a promise. It's a divine promise of protection. This divine promise of protection has calmed fears. It has brought comfort during this stressful time. Just knowing all that God promises to do, if we trust him, is enough to bring stability to us in crisis. But I believe that along with the comfort and belong with, along with the hope, that this psalm can also provide for us peace that we need as we begin this second phase of crisis management. Because in this psalm, we have all the ingredients we need to respond in peace in the midst of crises. And I've found three reasons in this psalm why we can have peace in the midst of crises, according to Psalm 91. I believe you can have peace in the midst of a pandemic, peace in the midst of crises, if you will, one, recognize the person of God. Mm -hmm. See, we can have peace in crises because of who God is. 
in this psalm, it is the psalm, psalmist who is writing it. But I believe God is, is writing through the psalmist and he's telling the psalmist, listen, let me reintroduce myself. Let me reintroduce myself. Let me, I, I need to let people, I need you to let people know who I am. And so in verse one of this psalm, the writer tells us that those who abide, those who live, those who stay, those who dwell under the shelter of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And so here, two, two names, two ways, two titles that God introduces himself to us. God introduces us to himself to us as the Most High God. He says, I am, I am the, the he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. The Most High is the God whose name is El Elyon. This is the God who is the strongest of the strong. This is the supreme God, the surpassing all others. This is the God that sits on the throne, the supreme authority of the whole world. This is the sovereign ruler of the universe. This is the God that holds the heart of rulers in his hand. This is the God that is above all powers and above all authorities. And as such, this is the God who puts us out of reach of trouble. This is the God who makes us inaccessible to the enemy. The most high God is a God that is higher than all earthly circumstances. He is the God who is above all human wisdom and above all human intellect. This is the God who causes world leaders to bow and humble themselves. When King Nebuchadnezzar exalted himself as God, this is the God that Daniel introduced him to. It is this God, El Elyon, that King Nebuchadnezzar had to bow down to and declare that he is indeed, that indeed Daniel's God was the most high God. And he says, he who, do, who, who, who is with the, the most high God shall dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. When he introduces himself as the Almighty, as the Almighty, he's introducing himself as El Shaddai. They that uh, stay under the shelter of the most high will abide under the shadow of the Almighty, the El Shaddai. This is the God of all power. The El Shaddai God is the God who is the omnipotent one. It is a name that God uses when he explains to Abraham that bringing forth a son from his two old loins is not impossible for God. This is the God who explains to Elizabeth that her womb is not too old to birth a son. This is the name of God that reminds us that absolutely nothing is too hard for our God. There is a promise inherent in the name that is that, is that El Shaddai is the almighty God who can do everything that God has promised. No person and no other power can thwart his ways. El Shaddai is the all-sufficient God. He has sufficiency of power. He has sufficiency of grace. He has sufficiency of provision, sufficiency of protection. El Shaddai is an awesome God. But then in verse number two, the writer declares that this is also the Lord Yahweh. He says, the Lord, uh, which is Yahweh, is my refuge and my fortress. He is my God in whom I trust. The Lord is the word Yahweh. This is the God uh, uh, who greets Moses in the burning bush and says that when they ask you who I am, tell them that I am who I am and I will be who I will be. I am the God who keeps covenant. I am the God who keeps my promises. I am the God who promises to be with you. When Jesus came to the earth, he appeared as Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus was bold enough to apply the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name to himself to remind us afresh that God is always present with us. This is the eternal God, the God who always was and the God who always will be. But then he says in the second part of verse two, he says, he says, my God. And when he says my God, he's using the term Elohim. My God, this writer now has become personal. He changes the description from the Lord to my God. How many of you know there's a difference between the Lord and my Lord? A difference between the God of Abraham and Sarah and my God who saved my soul. You see, my God is a term that implies that one has, has had an actual experience with God. It has gone from theory to practical. It has gone from hypothetical to reality. It has gone from speculation and conjecture to certainty in, and fact. My God implies that I've seen it with my own eyes. This is the God who has made 
God's self known to you personally. I no longer have to rely upon the preacher's God. I, I no longer have to rely upon mama and them's God. But this is my God. This is Elohim, the creator God, who revealed his pre-existence in the first sentence of the Bible when it was declared that Elohim created the heavens and the earth. See, this is the God who hovers. This is the God who watches. This is the God who can call something out of nothing. This is my God who has personally shown me his place of safety. This God doesn't have to build a fortress. My God is a fortress. My God is a refuge. My God in whom I trust. You see, I believe we can have peace in the midst of crisis when we remember just who God is. When we remember the personhood of God. When we stop and realize that we serve the God who is El Elyon, the most high God who can keep me out of the reach of the enemy. The God who doesn't compete with any king or president or Fortune 500 executive. This is the God who laughs at world leaders who think they are in control of our future. This is the name of God that reminds us that no earthly authority has supreme authority authority over us, that no government has the final say that God is large and in charge. You see, we can have peace when we reflect upon the sufficiency of our Lord, that even when we experience time of lack, that God has promised to supply everything that we need through his riches and glory, that God is able to provide what we need to make it through this crisis. We won't lack wisdom to make good decisions. We won't lack the courage to stand. We we won't lack the faith to overcome our fear. We won't lack joy to overcome our despair. We can have peace when we realize that our God is the Lord Yahweh, the promise keeper. As we navigate the crisis and we grab hold of the word, we can have confidence that our God will perform the word. We can have confidence that our God will be with us and show up in every moment as the need demands. We can have confidence that this God always was and always always will be. We can have peace when we realize that God is Elohim, that even when we are down to nothing, that our God can call forth something. When we take a glance over our shoulders and, and we see just how far God has brought us, when we look back and see that he was with us through the fire, when we look back and see that he was with us in the rain, when we look back and see that he was with us in the storm, it is then when we can declare that this God is my God, my Lord and my God. See, Psalm 91 assures us that we can have peace in crisis because it reminds us just who God is. It reminds us of the personhood of God. But not only does Psalm 91 remind us of the personhood of God, but Psalm 91 reminds us of the protection of God. That's why we love this psalm, because it, it reminds us that God is our protector, that the promise goes to the psalmist goes on to declare his assurances. He assures us that God will protect us. And then he, he gives a whole list of things that God will protect us from. And if you had to summarize them, I would just say he protects us from dangers seen and unseen. Because he first declares that he will protect us from the snare of the fowler. The snare of the fowler is the trap. You understand this is a trap that a hunter uses to catch his prey. It is a human design trap, and it is adapted to the nature of the creature that it hopes to capture. And what this is saying is God will protect us from the traps that are designed to catch us. God will protect us from the traps that have been adapted to our lights and our desires. See, the bait that is used in the trap is the thing that is attractive to us. But God says, I will protect you in that because the word says that our God says that with every temptation that comes to us, God will always provide a way of escape. But if we still fall into the trap, he promises us that you won't have to stay in the trap because God will deliver you from the snare. He will break the snare and let us go free. He is a deliverer. Hallelujah, somebody. He protects us not only from the, sna from the foulest snare. He's not only a deliverer, but he protects us from the deadly pestilence. This, is a, this word here is actually a plague, but it is a plague of a series of calamities. 
This is when a whole series of things just seems to keep on going wrong. I mean, first the car breaks down and, and then the hamster gets sick. The hamster recovers and the stove goes out. When we go through a series of trouble, it can be like an attack on our faith. But the psalmist declares that God will protect us. That God's faithfulness will be your defensive weapon. That his faithfulness will be your buckler and your shield. The fact that God is faithful will give you the peace you need that will keep you from slipping into hopelessness. When things are hitting us from every kind of way, it is then that God's faithfulness will be your buckler and your shield. That God's faithfulness will keep us from slipping into despair. And so God says he will protect us from the foulest snare, from the petulance, from the plagues of petulance. Then God says he will protect you from the fear of the tarot at night. Anybody ever been afraid to go to sleep at night? I mean, afraid of the boogeyman that might be under the bed or the, the boogeyman that might be in the closet or afraid of the thief that might come try to climb in your window. Afraid of the scary dreams that might try to invade your sleep. See, God says he will protect us from the fear of the terror. So you see, these are not actual things that have happened, but it is the fear of what might happen that terrorizes us. The fear of what I cannot see. The fear of what the future holds. The fear of what might go wrong. God says you don't have to fear unknown dangers. You don't have to fear unknown dangers that lurk in the night. You don't have to worry about what might happen. He says, I will deliver you from those fears. He says, I will protect you from the fear that the arrows that fly in the noonday. He said, you don't have to be afraid of the of tax that might happen. And you don't have to be afraid of the tax of the attacks uh, that will surely happen. You see, arrows are things that come fast. They come sure. They, 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 they come. They come and we can see them. He says, you don't have to be afraid of the arrows that come in the noonday because God will show you that they're coming. And finally, the psalmist says, we don't have to fear the pestilence that stalks in the night. A pestilence that stalks in darkness mimics the behavior of a nocturnal animal. The fox, the owl, they hunt in darkness. This was the danger that the Israelites dealt with with the 10th plague. It came upon them in the night. But God says, I don't care if it comes in the noonday, open. I don't care if it comes open to you or if it comes hidden. I will protect you because if you stay under the shelter of the Almighty, then no plague will come near your dwelling. He says, and the plague that comes in the noonday, he says, these are the illnesses and the diseases that we're dealing with today. The Ebola's, the smallpox, the COVID-19. He says, we don't have to fear sickness and disease. Oh, yes, we have to be wise. We have to take precautions. We have to wash our hands. We have to practice social distancing, but we don't have to fear because God said God will be our protection. And so when we think about Psalm 91, we can think about the fact that we can have peace in the midst of crisis. When we respond in crisis, we can respond in peace because we know the personhood of God and we know the protection of God. But then also Psalm 91 says one more thing, and that is that we can have peace in the midst of crises, in the midst of pandemic, because of the promises of God. We can have peace in the crises if we remember the promises of God. Mm -hmm. See, the psalmist has been talking all throughout this text. He, he, he's, he's the narrator. He's, he's telling the story. But if you'll notice, when you get down to verse number 14, the speaker changes. In verse number 14, Yahweh steps up to the mic. Yahweh says, listen, you heard the psalmist tell you who I was, but now let me have a word to say. Because I have made some promises towards you. And God begins to speak and God begins to say, listen, I made some promises. And God says, listen, I will deliver those who love me. He says, I will protect those who know my name. God is telling us that if we are in relationship with the divine, if you've made his wing your shelter, if you've made his arm your strength, then God's got you. The Lord says, if you've got me, then I've got you. If you choose to abide in me, then I will abide with you. God says to us, I promise you that I will deliver those who love me. And then he says, and I also promise you this. I promise you that I will answer those who call on me. 
for those who call on me, for those who call on me, the name of the Lord would be a strong tower. If you ask, you will receive. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open. And this is the confidence that we have towards him. We know that if we ask anything according to his will, that he hears us. And if he hears us, then we know we have the things for wherewith we have petitioned. God says, if you call on me, I will answer you. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He says, then will I hear from heaven. Then will I forgive their sin. And then will I hear their land. He says, whatever you ask in my name, this will I do that the father might be glorified. God says, I promise you that I will answer you when you call. And then he says, and I promise you, that I will satisfy you with long life. Now, I want you to know here, uh, for the, he's saying that for those who make uh, their hope in him, that God will make sure that you live a satisfied life. He's saying, I will make sure that you have enough of what you need. And this word, long life, translates to full life. God is not promising a specific number of years. He's not promising a numbers of years lived, but God is promising a life that is well lived. God is promising a fulfillment of our years. He's promising us that your life will be full. He's promising us that your life will be purposeful. He's promising you that your life will be satisfying. See, and when we think about the promises of God, that God promises that if you call on me, I'm going to answer you. That God promises us that if you, if you, if you love me, I'm going to protect you. That God promises us that he'll satisfy us with a full and abundant life. When we think about these promises, it can give us peace. And so I'm so glad today that Psalm 91 reminds us that we can have peace. Because there are a whole lot of folks in the world today who don't have peace of mind. People who can't sleep at night. People who are worried about what tomorrow will bring. People who are worried and concerned about the economy. People who are worried about their future of their families and the future of their friends. But I want you to know today, beloved, that God wants us to know that God gives peace to those who seek him. Knowing who God is, how God has revealed God's self in history in our lives will bring peace to us. Knowing the ways that God protects us will bring peace to us. And knowing that God makes promises to us and that those promises are yes and amen will bring peace to us. And God wants each of us to have and to live in that kind of peace. Because I want you to know today that the land may be filled with trouble. But when you put your trust in God, you can experience a peace that surpasses all understanding. That when you put your trust in God, we can experience a peace that you can't get from any other source. It is the peace that God wants us to have. And it is the peace that Jesus promised us as he returned to the Father. Did you ever think about that when Jesus was dying on the cross, that Jesus made a will? See, when Jesus died, he willed his body to Joseph of Arimathea. He willed his mother to a disciple named John. And he willed his spirit back to God, his father. But to his disciples, he left them something else. To his disciples, he said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. He says, let not your heart be troubled and let not your heart be afraid. When their lives were turned upside down, when they were dealing with the crises of Jesus leaving before they thought it was time, when the disciples didn't know which way to turn, it was then that they were reminded that Jesus had left them the peace of Christ. And the disciples had the peace of Christ ruling in their heart to deal with this crisis. They had peace to take the next steps. And I want you to know today, my brother and my sister, that if you are part of the kingdom of God, then you too have that peace because Jesus left something to you as well. Jesus has left us his peace. And that peace 
is what we need for the management of crisis. So I say to you today, you can have peace in the midst of a pandemic. Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be afraid. Now may the peace of God, may God the peace of the Lord himself, may he give you peace in all times and in every way. May the God of peace keep your heart and your minds through Christ Jesus. I want you to live in peace. I want you to walk in peace. I want you to sleep in peace. I want you to know that you've got peace. I want the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. I wish you just write peace down in the comments. That's what God wants you to have. He wants you to have an everlasting peace. A peace because you know who God is, because he's promised to protect you, and because every one of God's promises are yea and amen. Let's pray. Our God, our Father, I thank you. I thank you, God, that we can rest in you knowing that you've got us. God, that whenever trouble comes our way, we can hold on to your unchanging hand, knowing that you're going to carry us through. And God, throughout our lives, there'll be many other times when we're going to face all kinds of crises. But God, when crisis comes, remind us that you've left us your peace. Remind us that we can stand in peace knowing that we have a God who never leaves us and never forsakes us. And now, God, I pray that if there's one under the sound of my voice, God, who's, who, who doesn't have this kind of peace, God, who's worried, who's, who's anxious, who can't sleep at night, God, I, I pray tonight that today, God, that they would hear this message and realize that all you're asking to get all of these things you promised in Psalm 91 is that we would abide in you, that we would trust you, that we would give our lives to you, that there, this is a conditional promise, and the promise is to all who know you by your name. So God, I pray if there's one under the sound of my voice who hasn't accepted you huh, as Lord, as Savior, if they haven't accepted you as the Most High God, if they haven't accepted you as Almighty, God, today would be that day that they would give up trying to get peace from any other source. They would give up trying to get peace on their own. But God, they would look to you as the author and the finisher of their faith and their peace. God, I pray that they would come nigh unto you and that you will abide with them. God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Come on, if you prayed that prayer today, if you prayed that prayer today, I just need you to type in the comments, it's me, it's me, and somebody will reach out to you and help you to take the next steps. We, we, we want you to understand that this peace that we have, the world didn't give it to us, and so the world can't take it away. This peace that we have, the world didn't give it to us. God gave it to us. And so the world can't take it away. As long as we abide in him, he will abide with us. And we'll walk in perfect peace. Amen. What a joy it is to be able to share in the ordinance of communion with you and with your family. I hope that by now you have gathered some bread or some crackers, that you've gotten some kind of beverage or juice, or even if you have water. All that matters is that you have something that represents the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. Because this is what Jesus commanded his disciples to do on the night that he was betrayed. He gathered with them around the table and he invited them to break bread with him. And the text that records this, one of the, one of the texts that records this is found in Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to give you a minute to just find that on your phone or in your Bible because we want to read it together today. We want to read together what it is that Jesus is telling us when we take of this communion. Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. This is what it says. It says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it, for this 
is my body. And he took a cup of wine, and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them. And he said, each of you, drink of it. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and God's people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so today we're going to do just what Jesus commanded his disciples to do because that's who we are. We are his disciples. We're going to remember his supreme sacrifice for us. We're going to remember that his body was broken. We're going to remember that his blood was shed. And we're going to do it each in our own homes together. So I would ask now that you would get your elements as we pray and as we bless these elements together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for each person that is gathered around the table with their family, with their friends, or even by themselves. Because together, God, we are with you. And Father, we come now and we ask that you would bless these elements, whether they be crackers or bread, whatever it is, God, it represents your body that was broken for us. We ask now, God, that you bless it and you sanctify it. God, then we ask that you would bless this cup, bless this juice, bless whatever it is we have gathered together with. Bless it and sanctify it. For God, it is representation of your blood that was shed on Calvary. And now, God, we ask that you would bless it and sanctify it and make it holy, that as we partake thereof, we do it in remembrance of all that you have done for us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. And now I'd ask that you would get your bread, that you would hold it up to the Lord, and remember what he told us in Matthew, that he broke it. He blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it. And he said, eat, for this is my body that was broken for you. Let's eat together. And likewise, he says, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood that was shed for you. He says, it is a symbolic of the fact that God has made a covenant with us. That God has made a covenant of salvation with us. He said, drink of it and do it in remembrance of me. And every time you drink, you are remembering the fact that his blood was shed for our sins. Let's drink together. Amen. Amen. And then he tells us that they went out, they went out into the Mount of Olives singing a hymn. Well, I've got one of my favorite hymns today that I want to close our service with today. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for being a part of this virtual communion service. Thank you for remembering what Jesus did for us. And we're going to go out. You may not have a Mount of Olives. You may want to go out on your back porch. You may want to go out on the front yard. But just go out. We want to go out of this service singing. And I want to sing this song today. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can, what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, other found I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank God for his blood. I pray that you have a marvelous week and you go forth blessing the name of the Lord. God bless you. We'll see you soon.